Hey guys, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. And today we are going to be talking about a very, very special man. And I just wanted to say in this video, most of the pictures are from the actual area. Some of them I actually took. Uh, so just to give you a real sense of what happened. In any event, today we are going to be talking about John Donovan and how he gave his life to helping others. But even in death, he was able to continue on that mission. So John Donovan was um, a social worker. He grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here in the United States. Uh, he was born into a working class family, but unfortunately it was kind of problematic from the start. John's parents, his father left home when he was an infant and his mother died before he was uh, even 10 years old. So he just spent most of his younger years bouncing between Catholic orphanages, and then he eventually moved in with an unmarried aunt who took care of him. And John basically just sort of grew up like Oliver Twist. I mean, he was doing adult things as a child. He eventually joined the Navy and he was in the U.S. Navy for 15 years. But John is a very interesting person, very eccentric, and there's really nobody that can even account for his entire time being in the Navy. He was definitely in the Navy for that amount of time. And then he was a social worker at the Central State Hospital in Petersburg, Virginia where he often would work with uh, dual diagnosis patients, which can be very difficult. And he was just known for being so generous. He would take a lot of these patients out to certain events and do a lot of extra work. And even though he made decent money, John often lived in abandoned buildings, or at one point he was actually living in an abandoned uh, bank. So he definitely had some eccentricities about him. And for a sense of you know camaraderie and friends he had joined the old dominion appalachian trail club and this sort of became his sense of you know family he would go hiking with these people he spent thousands of hours every year hiking he hiked through the appalachian trail and it took him roughly 10 years but and he sectioned hiked it but he did complete the entire appalachian trail and he was just known as being uh, very stubborn at times. He was known to be not a good navigator. He didn't carry a compass and he would often wander off trail and find himself in situations where he was lost or he would eventually find his way back. But the friends and everybody who did know him and hike with him knew him to be sort of a notoriously bad navigator, although he was very stubborn and very sort of just had this will to keep going on. So John was nearing the age of retirement. He was 59 years old and he had decided that he was going to hike the Pacific Crest Trail since he had already completed the AT. This was his next big challenge. Now the Pacific Crest Trail is a national scenic trail that runs from Campo on the border of California and Mexico all the way up to Canada and it is an absolutely beautiful trail and it generally takes people five to six months could be faster it just depends on the person John did have experience on this trail he had been out there before but a through hike definitely requires a lot more planning John had been planning this hike for over a year and his nickname was El Burro because he was stubborn like a mule and he just liked to do things his own way and when he first got into backpacking he was carrying a lot of gear he definitely wasn't uh, what we call ultra light now but then he met a friend who sort of transcended him into ultra light backpacking John didn't get started in backpacking till his 40s and he was mainly doing it to lose weight but then when he met his friend, Ken Baker, Ken got him into ultralight backpacking. He showed him that, you know, he could carry less and the, the, the hikes would be more comfortable and more fun. And so this is what John sort of aspired to do was just hike ultralight. And what that means for anyone that doesn't know, it's just basically taking the bare necessities, whatever you can just to, you know, so it won't be like a full tent, maybe just a, a tarp. And this is exactly what John did. He carried a tarp 
Uh, instead of carrying gloves, he just carried an extra pair of socks to wear around his hands. John had originally planned to hike the, his upcoming PCT hike with his friend Ken Baker, uh, a re retired mechanical engineer. Um, but unfortunately, Baker was just, he was more experienced and he was more mechanically inclined and he just had sort of had a better sense of things. And he had told Donovan that he wanted to postpone the trip by three weeks because he had been looking at the weather data and it looked bad, especially in Southern California. It was the snowiest winter that they had in over 30 years, but there was basically nothing he could say to dissuade Donovan. Uh, he tried, but Donovan was insistent and Don that's kind of why they called him El Burro. And he, John Donovan decided that he was going out to the PCT and was going to do this on his own. So on April 19th, the day that he retired, his office friends threw him a little party, and that was it. John Donovan was gone. He flew out to California to start his PCT through hike by himself, and he was doing a northbound hike, so he was headed from uh, Campo to Canada. Now, he did meet up with his friend Lynn Paget, who was a younger guy that Donovan had hiked with in the past. They enjoyed each other's company. They had they knew each other from hiking parts of the Appalachian Trail. And yeah, so anyway, before they got started, Donovan went to this uh, little place in San Diego called Alacala Mission, and he lit two candles. And one was to honor St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers, and the second for uh, St. Anthony, the patron saint of the lost. You know, he wasn't a very religious man, but having grown up in all these Catholic orphanages, it was part of his, his, his soul. And in his words, he said he would need these saints' help on this hike. So the two men got started on April 24th in Campo. They hiked north. Now, the first, few hundred, the first hundred miles are always a little rough because, you know, your feet, your body are getting adjusted. At first, Donovan was having a little problems. He lost his quote-unquote lucky pants. But by the time they got to Warner Springs, Paget's feet were so swollen that he was just going to take some time. So Donovan decided to hike out of Warner Springs, which is this area right here. And it's it's crazy because the Warner Springs area is uh, flat, grassy, but it goes starts going uphill very quickly. And about 60 miles outside of Warner Springs, you come into the Mount San Jacinto Mountains, which are a very steep, huge, crazy area of the trail. San Jacinto is the first major mountain on this through hike. And by the time Donovan began climbing it on May 2nd, 2005, there were immediate signs of danger. There was already three feet of snow and the meteorologists were predicting a heavy snowstorm. Many of the hikers that were already in that area had decided to detour it west from an intersection called Saddle Junction. Hikers feared that the storm would hit as they were climbing Fuller Ridge, which is a very steep, rocky spine rising to almost 8,800 feet, about five miles north of the Saddle Junction. So around noon on May 3rd, three well-equipped hikers whipped down the ridge and encountered Donovan, and they warned him that, that they had seen clouds sweeping in, that there was, a, there was danger, and according to these two guys, he was just adamant. He said, you know, he had the bull by the horns and he was going to take this on, and there was no convincing him otherwise. By 1 p.m. on May 3rd, Donovan was definitely having doubts. He had climbed into Little Takitz Valley, just south of Saddle Junction, and he found that the trail that was mostly visible up till then was now completely concealed by snow. And the footprints in those type of areas, they just look like they're all over the place. It's very hard to, to follow them. I mean, because people go off trail to go to the bathroom. In any event, there was no blazes on the trees. So Donovan sought help from two other hikers, a Canadian nurse named Connie Davis, who was 46, and her 20-year-old son, both of whom were very, very experienced hikers. Donovan camped near the Davieses that night, and, the, you know, they, they had a great time. They got along well, so he told them, like, you guys just... I'll hike with you guys. So Donovan began following the Davies through the snowfield. Connie told him, we're not going to take the most direct route. We're just going to, you know, take this smart. 
So Donovan stayed about 30 feet behind them. He put on his crampons, which are basically like spikes, but since Donovan was going ultra light, he only had trail runners, which they weren't working very well for him. He kept falling. The Davies were just doing their thing, kind of taking pictures and trying to help him out, but he was behind them. So the Davies followed a small creek uphill and toward northwest, roughly half a mile south of Saddle Junction, and that's basically the last time they saw him. It was about 8,000 feet on the afternoon of May 3rd. He was very close to Saddle Junction. The patchy snow was patchy at that point, but you could see hints of trail. It's hard to say what actually happened to John during this time. It's possible he just took a break or took a side trail or wandered off. He was very notorious for doing this. Uh, one time in you know, an, an AT hike, he had wandered off the trail by like three miles, and it took him hours to you know, basically find his way back. So this wasn't an uncommon thing for him, but as far as what we do know that the weather was absolutely horrible at this point, there was already three feet of snow on the ground and there was a big blizzard that was moving into the area that would dump over eight inches of new snow. And unfortunately, his friends back home, because they were either busy or just not really checking in, no one really noticed that he was missing for almost 15 days and that's when his friend noticed that he hadn't picked up several of his mail parcels that he had sent so it wasn't until then where they dispersed uh, search and rescue and of course at this point the weather is terrible they have no idea where he is so they have no idea really to start where to start looking they obviously made an effort but after a few days they just the search was called off and they assumed that he had perished somewhere in that Mount San Jacinto area, and no one ever saw him again. Palm Springs, California lies on the other side of the mountain, Mount San Jacinto, and it's a beautiful place, and it's just such a bizarre thing that, you know, you've got these huge mountains, and then this sort of desert, flat, really warm scenic beautiful spot and a young couple by the name of Brandon Day and Gina Allen were here. Brandon had a, a conference that he was attending and he had decided to bring his new friend Gina along with him to this conference and this conference was being held in Palm Springs and the, these two were very young. Brandon was 28, Gina was only 24 at the time and Brandon had grown up in Texas. He was a football star in high school. He had played fullback, I believe. And these two met online. They met on MySpace. And Gina had been an all-American cheerleader. So they had all things in common from the very beginning. And Gina said that she was just drawn to him from this. And Gina was from Iowa and had moved to Dallas, Texas for work. And she had met Brandon their first date. He had taken her to this sort of interesting restaurant where it was sort of a Moroccan place and they sat on the floor in pillows. And it was just really interesting. And they, they just hit it off from the beginning. And Brandon decided to go out on a limb and invite her to this conference. So after the conference, uh, they were hanging out. They had gone out one night and just sort of partied and drank a little bit too much. And then some friends suggested that they take the tram up to the top of the mountain. Now this tram will take you all the way from Palm Springs to the top of Mount San Jacinto in like 11 minutes. It's like a 9,000 mile climb in less than 11 minutes, which is pretty awesome if you think about it. It's a very popular tourist thing. People come to Palm Springs and ride this tram all the time. It's been around forever. And once you get up to the top, there's absolutely beautiful views. There's a restaurant where you can get drinks. And this was their plan to ride the tram up to the top, get some drinks, take some pictures of the, the scenery. But of course, they had only dressed for you know, this slight adventure. So she was wearing you know, a tank top and shorts, and he was wearing a, he did bring a jacket because the friend did say it gets cold up there. There's also a trail 
that they decided that they were going to do called the Desert View Trail. Now this trail isn't that long, it's about a mile and a half round trip, but it also offers scenic views and just a, a beautiful area. And of course they noticed the snow around, so they had a little snowball fight between them. And then Brandon said that he wanted to show Gina this, this waterfall. So they kind of hiked off trail and started hiking down through the brush kind of searching out the sound of this waterfall. And they just eventually found it and it was, a, it was a really small little waterfall, not anything like what they were picturing, but you know, they took some pictures and sat there and chatted for a while. And then they knew they had to be back by 3 p.m. So eventually they got up and said, yeah, we should start heading back. And so they started heading back. But as they did, they noticed that they were sort of at a loss. They couldn't really find their way. At this point, they weren't too concerned. They followed voices for a while, only to discover, in fact, they were chasing echoes. And by 5 p.m., they had wandered back down to Long Creek, which they seemed from, seen from the overlook. They yelled for help, but of course, no one heard them. They just kept hitting dead ends, and the mountain just kept forcing them downwards. And when dusk came, they sort of... Uh, came to grips with the fact that they were going to have to stay out there and they were above 7,000 feet and one was in a tank top and one was in a windbreaker and neither of them really had any outdoor experience and this was just slowly creeping in to be a nightmare. Luckily Brandon found a small cave and they were able to seek a little bit of shelter in there at least from the wind but they both said that it was you know the coldest night they had ever ever gone through. And of course they didn't sleep much, so all they had were their thoughts, and they were thinking, well, okay, the the tour people have to have noticed that we didn't make the tour bus back, we weren't on the tram, but in actuality, the tour bus people just assumed, wrongfully so, that they had found another ride home via a taxi or by some other means. So they had some hopes, but in actuality, nobody was looking for them at this point. And the next morning they thought, well, this was the worst of it, so we just got to figure out how to get out of here. So the first attempt was they climbed back up and they could sort of see Palm Springs in the distance and they thought, oh, okay, well, it can't be that, that hard. We'll just climb all the way back down. And eventually, you know, people hike here all the time and eventually we'll run into somebody or in any event, this proved to be a lot more difficult than they had anticipated. There was waterfalls and rocks and crevices all over the place. Brandon at one point fell into the water, his shoes and socks got soaked, and they were just having an absolutely miserable time. And just imagine, this is only really technically their second date. So, but according to them, they both really handled this as best as possible in this type of a situation. But unfortunately, as the day progressed, they realized that they were gonna have to spend another night out there in the cold. And of course they didn't sleep much, so all they had were their thoughts and they thought, okay, well the hotel staff has gotta be alerted to the fact that we never showed back up. So, and again, that might've been true, but unfortunately their hotel automatically checked them out and the rooms hadn't been made up. So in fact, no one was looking for them. On their third day through this lost venture, they were just, you know, exhausted. They hadn't eaten anything. And at this point, they hadn't drank in any of the water because they thought they might get sick from parasites. But, you know, they had just been climbing so much, they decided that they would drink the water. And a lot of these downhills were just, you know, falling over rocks. And at one point, Brandon saw something in the distance and he said, it looks like a campsite. And Gina was like, no, but as they got closer, they could, could tell it was a campsite. And at first they were elated, but then as they started looking around, they could tell that this was not looking good. So their initial sense of elation by thinking like, oh, we've come across a hiker or camper that'll know what they're doing was then very quickly met with sorrow when they realized that this was an abandoned campsite. They found a pair of glasses in the dirt, an old razor, a pair of sneakers, and really they didn't know what to think until they came across some scribbled on papers and photocopied maps and they saw the date and they're like may 8th that's today wow there's got to be someone around and then brandon took a closer look and he's like gina this is a year out of date this is one year ago so one year ago to the day that something happened to this person so again they were just devastated by this blow and they started reading some of the notes and 
This person had written that they were trapped in by a giant gorge and that they had taken a fall. They were down to their last two crackers. So of course, after reading this, Brandon just knew he had to kind of stay positive and try and get Gina out of there and he was determined to get them down. But it wasn't long until they ran into this gorge that the person had been talking about. And once they came across it, they knew that they were trapped. There was no way they could go back up all those steep climbs. They had just come down and no way around this 100-foot waterfall gorge. So they made their way back to the camp. And, you know, they stayed there for the night. They had at least this guy's um, tarp and a sweater. And they were able to have a little bit better of a night this night. And the next morning, Gina decided to... She saw the uh, a bag that she hadn't noticed the day before and it was over in the, kind of in the brush and she opened it up and it was this guy's personal identification and it was John Donovan, John Donovan's campsite. This is what they had discovered. And they found his ID and after going through the bag, she also discovered some waterproof matches and various other things that John had wrapped up, socks and various other things that and notes that they had left. He had left the note where he wanted to be buried and a goodbye note. And it was just all so devastating. And Brandon went down to get some water from the little pool and he discovered John Donovan's body right in this little pool pictured here. And so the two of them grabbed some of his stuff. They grabbed all his personal effects because Gina wanted to hopefully give them to the family if they got out. But they at this point were just thinking of anything they could do. They kind of went back over towards the gorge and set up sort of behind it. They put the tarp up and you know, the both of them were so exhausted at this point, they just had no idea what to do next. And they were just, they hadn't eaten anything in days. And in his desperation, Brandon decided that he was gonna use the matches to create a giant forest fire. He's, I did, he just decided I'm gonna set this whole place on fire. And if people don't see that, then we have absolutely no chance of survival. And that's what he did. Apparently he just lit a match, he found a good spot, and he said that it was actually surprising how quick it took. And they waited and watched for about 45 minutes. The fire started putting itself out and they didn't hear anything, but then just as they were just about to fully lose hope, they saw the helicopter come across the top of the gorge. The helicopter pilot came over his loudspeaker and said, Brandon and Gina, and they were like, yeah, of course, who else would it be? Because at this point, people were looking for them. The helicopter came back with rescuers. They dropped down. They were able to rescue Brandon and Gina. And now they were telling the story about John Donovan. And now we know what happened to John Donovan. From his journals, we learn that after parting company with the Davies on May 3rd, he tried to detour west down into Idlewild, but with no way to navigate, he became disoriented. In the journal written in the margins of his photocopied pages, Donald scribbled that he couldn't find the trail to Iowa, Idlewild. So instead, he was drawn by the lights of the much larger Palm Springs. He traveled about three miles northeast from Saddle Junction area that night. He traversed Skinny Willow Creek, then climbed a small ridge and plunged down into a steep gash called Hidden Valley. As he dipped into lower, hardier climate zones, the brush became nasty and thick, with thick manzanillas and all kinds of stuff. John's journal places him in Long Valley at about 4,300 feet the night of May 3rd. On May 5th, he was still camped in the same ravine, and that's when he took a fall. How badly he was hurt is unclear. Donovan did not elaborate in his journal, but clearly the ordeal of the last few days had finally taken its toll on him. He wrote that he had already become too weak to climb out of the canyon. The cryptic notes that Donovan had scribbled depicted the man coming to terms with the bleakness of his situation. He did try to signal for help. He built a few weak fires that smoldered out due to the winds massive snows and wind he flashed a mirror at the sky no one saw him and then he came across the hundred foot waterfall that lay directly below his campsite and the canyon's walls were basically sheer he was boxed in and he likely knew that his days were probably numbered at one point on may 5th donovan took an inventory of his supplies and he was down to his last 12 cheese crackers he also made some notes about his friend ken baker saying that he had been the smart one and he had regretted not heeding his advice about waiting 
and he told Baker he wanted to be buried in the Navy Cemetery. On May 11th, he celebrated his 60th birthday by eating two of his, his crackers. In his last entry, dated May 14th, he scribbled that he was going down to Long Creek for water. Goodbye and love you all, he wrote. And those were his final words. Obviously, Brandon and Gina are just eternally grateful to John Donovan. I mean, without his supplies and his matches, they were trapped in the same situation and they would have perished as well. And this case is just, it's just so touching because, you know, John Donovan gave his life to helping others. And even in death, he was able to help people. Of course, search and rescue went in for John's body. They had to wait about a month due to the weather. But here are pictures and audio from that recovery effort, as well as afterwards a tribute to John. They, the goal set of the major expedition to chop their way down to the water. They just got down to the water right now, and they're heading downstream and commencing the search. Copy. Um, from reading his notes, he had the same expedition to get to the water. This story just really touched me and I wanted to make this video for, for John Donovan because, you know, on my channel I mainly cover missing hiker cases that, that still haven't been found and every once in a while, even though this case ended in tragedy for one, it was like John needed to carry on his mission and he was there to help save Brandon and Gina. And it's just such a touching story all around. And I wanted to put these candles and his two saints here at the end, just in honor of John and you know his, his life that he led helping others. And even in death, he was able to carry on that mission and help Brandon and Gina survive their terrible ordeal. And the fact that it was exactly one year from the day that John was there is just unbelievable to me. So obviously dedicating this video to John Donovan and all the wonderful things he did throughout his life and just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful human being. Thank you everybody for watching. Stay healthy and safe and I'll see you next time. Take care.